I have some updates for you today. We have a little Alex, a little Russell Lafitte, a little Corey Fleming, and a bit of Austin Stanley vs. Will Folks, all in the form of recently filed court documents. It's a group of guys who messed up, don't like to admit it, and don't want to pay the price for it. So it's time to get irked. Let's get started. This is Legal Updates with Cassidy. The Alex Murdoch Posse and their ongoing fight for special treatment. Welcome. Let's start off with Corey Fleming since his is the quickest and there isn't a whole lot to report. The last time I updated you on Corey, there was some confusion on the status of his appeal. Now remember, he came before the court all contrite, all sorry, all ready to plead guilty, but when he got more than a slap on the wrist, he cried foul and appealed it. I'll link the last update in case you missed it, but his lawyers in their hurry to appeal didn't wait until financial restitution had been set, which has to happen before an appeal can be filed. The only thing that had been settled was his prison term, but the financial portion had not been completed. With our very dearest Judge Newman retiring in the middle of it, a new judge had to be assigned and his schedule had to be set up. So the court ordered the appeal in abeyance until restitution could be settled, and that was back in April. So on July 22nd, the court said, Hey, back on April 15th, I issued an order for a hearing on restitution. So you must provide an update within 10 days detailing your efforts to schedule this matter for a hearing. Then, on July 31st, there's a joint filing from Sir Creighton Waters and Miss Franklin Best telling us that they are negotiating a resolution and preparing a scheduling order for a hearing in the event that a resolution cannot be reached, with an anticipated hearing date in early November. They also state that they've reached out to the new judge, His Honor Heath Taylor, to request a status conference and put a scheduling order in place. We've covered this before, but if you're new or even just as a reminder, the scheduling order is a timetable that's set by the court that tells each side when their filings are due by. Things like briefs, motions, discovery, they will all have deadlines made by the court, and that keeps things running smoothly and in a timely manner. A few days ago, on August the 5th, there was a status report that let us know that there was a status conference scheduled with the new judge on August 8th. So that would have taken place by now. Nothing new has been filed since that status conference, so I'm not sure what matters were settled or discussed at this time, but I will be checking back to see if anything gets filed that will give us a clue. So what do we know about this new judge, Judge Taylor? Taylor received his undergraduate degree in history from Newberry College in 1995 and his JD from the University of South Carolina School of Law in 1998. He formerly served as an assistant prosecutor for the town of Irmo and as associate municipal judge for the city of West Columbia. Two of his prominent cases from last year are so polar opposite to each other that it's hard to believe the rulings came from the same judge. The first one we're going to cover had me impressed. This was the case of a man who raped a University of South Carolina student during a burglary, and he was sentenced to life without parole. During the sentencing, Judge Taylor was very strong in his words to the defendant. He said that he was shocked at the crime's brutality and that he always had wondered why burglary first degree, which is one of the crimes that the defendant was convicted of, why it carried the possibility of a maximum life sentence. And he goes on, now knowing the facts of this case, a life sentence makes sense. He did give the defendant a life sentence on the burglary, and he added 30-year sentences each for kidnapping and criminal sexual conduct. The jury only took 30 minutes to find the defendant guilty on all three charges. And I just want to add that I hate the assumption that if a jury makes up their mind quickly, that there's something wrong with their decision. To be honest, when jurors take a long time to decide, I feel like there's something a little more suspicious. That means they didn't all agree and that at least some had to be talked into it. When they all make a quick, decisive verdict, 
I think their minds are very clear. I think there's not a lot of questions and less chance that someone or something influenced someone to make a decision that they didn't really feel strongly about themselves. But that's just my opinion. But Judge Taylor went on, I don't have the words for how depraved this crime was. I watched the surveillance video. It wasn't nobody but you. It wasn't even a close call. It was despicable what you did to that young lady that night. I don't understand it. You sought this young lady out. This was a plan. You didn't just happenstance into her apartment and decide to sexually assault her. You made a plan. You'd been looking for her, following her. I don't have the words. I was also touched by what he said directly to the victim. She took the stand and testified during the trial, for which he called her a brave young woman, an impressive and strong young lady. And he continued, I'm sorry you went through this. It was so nice to see him protecting a woman. I was so happy that he took these charges seriously, that he made sure the punishment fit the crime, and that he praised this woman. Because even in this day, there are many women who are too frightened to go this far, to make a report, to take it to court, to get up and testify. So I'm very pleased to see the way he handled this situation and tried to build her back up, to make her feel heard, to let it be known what happened to her was despicable, not just to her, but how the court saw it. Hopefully, that helped her to begin to heal from her horrible ordeal. But remember I said there were two cases that are so polar opposite, it seems like different judges. So here's the other case. I don't understand how he could feel the way he felt about this one and then make this decision in another. So this is a case where a man had been dating a woman for about six months and they broke up. Despite the breakup, they remained on speaking terms. On March 11th of 23, Tiffany, who is the victim in the story, had planned to go to a St. Patrick's Day celebration. Now on that day, she also had spoken to Lance who is the defendant in this story. So he promises her that he'll change his behavior and wants to get back together with her. He asked if he could go along with her to her celebration. Tiffany felt that it wasn't a good idea, but she relented and let him come along. Afterwards, he came with her back to her home. Tiffany felt that he'd had too much to drink and shouldn't drive, so she told him he could spend the night, but insisted that he sleep in the guest room. Well, this made Lance angry. He didn't get what he wanted, so he grabs her and screams at her, Why can't you just love me? Frightened, Tiffany starts to cry, tells him that he's hurting her, but he will not let her go. She finally struggles, gets away, gets to the phone to call the police. He grabs her phone and throws it somewhere she can't reach it. Tiffany grabs her dog, runs upstairs, and locks herself into her bedroom. But Lance is just getting started. He takes her jacket, lights it on fire, and shoves it under the door. Being upstairs with your house on fire is not an ideal place to be. So she opens the door and runs outside before the fire can get too out of control. Lance hasn't left the house. Instead, she sees him trying to light her clothes on fire. She asks him, what are you doing? To which he says, I'm going to burn the whole mf -er down. Tiffany runs outside and is able to call 911. When the police get there, her couches are on fire and Lance remains inside. Officers demand for him to come out, but he refuses. So they enter the home, find him upstairs and arrest him. He's charged with assault and battery of a high and aggravated nature, kidnapping, and arson in the second degree. So Lance gets out on bond, but during the bond setting, the magistrate judge gave strict no contact orders. He is not to contact Tiffany in any way, but a short time later, he sends her flowers. Two days after that, he texts her seven times. She responds by filing a restraining order. Now in the receipts, his note with the flowers was, it's always been you, Tiff. 
signed CB, which are not his initials. And so at first, Tiffany doesn't know who sent the flowers, but that's all tracked down through receipts and payments, and it does turn out to be from him. So this was a clear violation of the no contact order. So the state files a notice of an emergency motion to revoke bond. It gets sent, and at this time the case is being heard by Judge Murphy. But when it's time for the hearing, we find out that Lance has checked himself into the Medical University of South Carolina. The hearing went forward, and Judge Murphy revoked the defendant's bond. He could continue his treatment at the medical facility, but he would not be free to discharge himself and had to be equipped with a GPS monitor, after which, on his discharge, he would be returned to the Dorchester County Detention Center. But Lance doesn't like that very much. Much like the rest of these men, who are so very willing to commit these crimes, but don't want to pay for them. He and his attorneys right away start motions to reinstate his bond. Now, Tiffany hears of this, so she writes a letter to beg the court to keep his bond revoked. She tells the court that she wants to request the revocation of Lance Cox's bond because Lance violated his bond conditions that were set forth by Judge Shelbourne on April the 5th, and again on April the 7th, when he contacted me against the zero contact restrictions outlined in his bond documentation. She tells the story that I just read to you about being assaulted and her home and her things in her home being set on fire. She tells the court after the attack, she set up a security system, motion detector lights, and obtained a firearm to protect herself. And here's where we find this out. She has two children. She goes on to say that she visited the victim's advocate, Margie Richter, but was told that she was not eligible for an order of protection because she was not married to Lance, didn't share a residence, or have a child together. Now, what kind of garbage is that? That needs to be changed. But moving on, she wants a restraining order at least, but she can't even get that until this goes to trial. Then she tells how he went several weeks with no contact, then sent those flowers, then sent those messages. Then we learn he also contacted her neighbors. What were in his messages? He said he was on the way. How terrifying. This mom and her kids, he's already set their things on fire. He's already been ordered by the court, zero contact, and he sends her messages saying he's on the way. As a woman... That's terrifying. Her neighbors called 911, allowed her to come to their house in case he did show up. He also starts threatening suicide, and the best that anybody could do for her was a deputy Barrington advised that he could write a warrant for harassment. Because of these violations, he prepares the warrant, but comes to her and says it probably won't be signed because Lance didn't actually threaten her. But that's left to interpretation, because saying I'm on the way to your house is a threat. When the last time you were there, you physically assaulted her and set her things on fire, and you've been court-ordered to stay away, zero contact, on the way is a threat. But that's not how it was seen. She goes on to say that Lance threatened to kill himself three times in the six months that they dated that she and Lance's brother had done an intervention because he kept sending texts threatening to kill himself and then would not respond to make them think that he was in fact dead. He also would go out on her balcony and threaten to jump. So she tells the court, he's not only a danger to himself, he's a danger to me, my children, my family, and my friends. Please consider the severe nature of the initial charges and the fact that he has zero respect in complying with bond conditions, on top of being suicidal and a threat to my well-being as well as my children's. And so she asked the court to keep him behind bars until his trial date because no one is safe with him in society. Now you'd think that the judge we heard in the other case would recognize the danger here would see how the other case turned out, would see this man clearly mentally ill, already could have killed her that day. It's going to have a strong ruling in this case, right? Well, here's his order. He goes through the story, the what the defendant is charged with, one count of arson, second degree, kidnapping, an assault and battery of a high and aggravated nature, that his bond had been revoked by Judge Murphy, that the defendant violated the no-contact order, 
that the defendant suffers from depression, attempted suicide, spent a considerable amount of time in this medical facility for a suicide attempt, and received mental health treatment, states that the victim is afraid of the defendant and does not wish for him to be released, and inexplicably, after hearing the arguments, this court finds that the defendant's bond should be reinstated. Can somebody explain how he came to this decision? The only saving grace, as he goes on to say that due to the serious nature of the charge, that he is to be under home detention with GPS monitoring installed, and he should not leave home except for traveling to and from work, time looking for work, medical or psychiatric treatment, counseling, things like that, attending any kind of educational institution, religious services, or legal appointments and court appearances. Now, here's the thing. It's just a monitor. If he really, truly heads her way, is someone going to be there to stop him before he gets there? Someone who's suicidal, nothing to lose? These are the very ones that commit these kind of crimes every day in our world. Every day, three women in this country are killed every single day by a husband, a boyfriend, or an ex. Every day. Who do you think is doing this? These kind of men. And these numbers will go on and they will rise until the courts and the police take these situations seriously. Three of us no longer exist every single day because we loved the wrong person. I have so many questions after I read this. Would he feel okay putting such a man out if it were his daughter that was the target? Sister? Any woman that he loves? Would he feel so flippant about releasing such a man? Oh, we'll monitor him. He spoke on this man's mental illness. Did he feel like that was a reason for leniency instead of seeing it as further reason to be frightened for this woman? Is he so wholly unaware that people in desperate mental crises are the ones that are most likely to escalate the violence, especially suicidal people with the nothing to lose mentality? Has he never seen a case where the man's attitude was, if I can't have you, no one can? I, you know, in the other case, he said, I have no words. I have no words about this one. I sit and worry about Tiffany now. I've never met the woman. I don't even know what she looks like. I hope you're okay, Tiffany. It's horrible. But here's his attorney, Chris Murphy. And guess what? Chris Murphy is a lawyer, legislator. This is a serious problem in South Carolina. South Carolina is one of a very limited number of states where legislators appoint the very judges that they will practice under. Think about that for a minute. In South Carolina, these men who appoint these judges are still practicing law. How can we expect fair rulings in such an atmosphere. This situation is a mess. So they're not only taking advantage of the fact, hey, I appointed you, you owe me a good ruling here, but they also are there to throw cogs in the judicial system arrangement. What do I mean by that? In some of the bigger cases, there's ample attorneys already on the case actually doing the legal work. They'll throw in one of these lawyer legislators. Because why? Because they get immunity during sessions. They can stall a case for literally years. We've seen it. We saw Rutherford do this in Russell Lafitte's case. There's a whole group of attorneys doing the actual legal work. What does Rutherford do? He shows up to the hearings. He shows up not to speak. He shows up to make faces and to throw wrenches into the timelines. I remember watching him at one of Russell Lafitte's hearings. He shows up in flashy clothes and cufflinks paying no attention at all while Mark Moore stood there sputtering and stalling. And I was sitting there wondering, what are you doing here? And I felt like Judge Newman knew exactly what was up. Because in the hearings I've seen, at the end of Moore's little performance, Judge Newman always turns and asks Rutherford to speak. Now, I never saw him do that to anyone else. So in in my heart, I would kind of giggle because that's exactly what I would do. If I thought this man was just there to stall, you better believe I'm making that man at least stand up and address the court. Make him have to get up and speak on the case that we all know he did no actual legal work on. He's there as a time-stalling pawn. And of course, 
When Judge Newman would ask him to speak, he had nothing of value to add. He never spoke in detail. He never spoke in the facts of the case. He just stood up and did his typical smooth operator talk. He would just rattle off, oh, I'm on this case, and then I have sessions. And that's why Russell Lafitte's case has taken so very long. Judge Newman's already retired. It's still going on because of Rutherford, the lawyer legislator. And I hope that this was not the reason that Lance's bond was reinstated as some sort of favor for this lawyer legislator from this judge. So I'm really confused about what to think about this judge. His rulings, like I said, so polar opposite with these two cases. So we'll see how he rules for Corey when the time comes. Now let's move on to Russell. As you all know, he, like Alex and Corey, is extremely unhappy with his prison sentence. He avoided it as long as he possibly could and has been busy still claiming to have been duped by Alex and trying to convince us that he's just so innocent and so brand new. No one's bought it, of course, but he still has that right and the gall to tie up the courts with his tantrums. And so we find his next big move will be a hearing for his appeal on September 25th in Richmond, Virginia at 9.30 a.m. Now, if you remember, Russell did not plead guilty. He pleaded not guilty, but was found guilty anyway. So this hearing, it's based on a jumbo-sized appellate brief with six public volumes and one sealed volume's worth of declarations of innocence and claims of unjust and unfair treatment. Now, the link in blue on here is for an oral argument form, and we see that both sides filed theirs already. And from those, we learn that on the defense side, attorney William Wilkins will be the principal speaker, and he slotted for himself 15 minutes. And then John C. Neiman Jr. will handle the rebuttal, for which he slotted five minutes. Then we have the government attorneys, with Kathleen Stoughton slated for 10 minutes as principal, and our favorite lady lawyer, Miss Limehouse, has seven principal minutes, and she will also handle the rebuttal, where she has slated three minutes for that. Now remember, federal court is not televised, so we will have to rely on the trusty printed page for the outcome of that hearing, and I will be on the lookout for that, and will update you then. I'm also going to link some of my previous updates that outline the claims that Russell made for his innocence, so look for that in comments. I'll have quite a few to link there today. But we have about a six-week wait until this hearing to find out where his case goes next. Finally, we come to Alex's update. As I mentioned in a recent update, and also gave you a recording of his federal sentencing hearing, Alex has filed an appeal for this very sentencing, where he pleaded guilty. The U.S. attorneys have filed for that appeal to be dismissed for the very reasons that I and a lot of you were asking about after the last update. Doesn't a plea agreement mean you're accepting the sentencing? It's supposed to, and this motion makes that point very well. Now, it does repeat the points a number of times, so I'm going to simplify it a little bit and hit their main points for why they say the appeal should in fact be dismissed. It takes several pages to retell the history of this sordid case. I think we're all pretty familiar with that, so I'm going to skip over all of that. And this review takes us up to page 6, where it reminds us that Alex entered into a plea agreement with the government and that he's aware that signing this agreement waives the right to contest either the conviction or the sentence in any direct appeal or other post-conviction action, including any proceedings, with the only exceptions being ineffective assistance of counsel, prosecutorial misconduct, or future changes in the law that affect the defendant's sentence. Alex's team has not charged any of these things, even though these are the only three reasons Alex could have to file an appeal. Now, Part C clarifies all the ways that the court made sure that Alex was in his right mind, not altered by drugs, fully capable of understanding the agreement, that he was satisfied with his attorneys, had enough time to discuss the case with his attorneys, had no complaints against his attorneys, and that all charges had been reviewed with him before signing. He also testified that no one had threatened him or promised him anything, and he affirmed that he was pleading guilty of his own free will because he is, in fact, guilty. 
Part D describes how the sentencing hearing went, and I won't spend time on that, but if you're not familiar with it, again, the complete reading of this hearing is also linked in comments, and in that you'll find that the court listened to his objections at the time and explained themselves very clearly. It's all there. As part of that hearing, defense attempted to bring up others who were convicted for similar conduct, but the government and then in turn the court shot that down by mentioning how Alex's victims were the exceptionally vulnerable, a paraplegic, motherless children, widowers, and also the disgrace it brought to every level of the law. And these are some of the points that get repeated multiple times throughout this document. I also love how Judge Gergel was not buying the amount of opiates that Alex claimed he was on, saying how could he have even pulled off these complex transactions if he were truly impaired to the extent that he's trying to claim. And he also mentioned how Alex had persuaded others to join him. Moving along in the document, the court emphasizes it again, how vulnerable his victims were. Not just that they were vulnerable all the time, but at a time where their lives were turned upside down and they placed all of their hopes in Alex. That's when he abused and stole from them. It again stressed the complexity of his schemes. And because Jim at the time, Jim Griffin, had made the claim, well, Alex is already being punished by the state for these same crimes. So why should the federal court punish him as well? But the court reminded him that there were 11 victims that were not a part of the state convictions. So it's not all the same crimes. They also talked about how some had had damages covered, but by other people, like the law firm, insurances, but that Alex had not spent a dime of his own money to make any of his victims whole. The court also explained that a lengthy sentence was necessary to promote respect for the law that Alex had brought so much disgrace on and also to provide justice for the victims who were made to suffer anguish on top of the tragedies that brought them to Alex in the first place. Part E comes back again to the fact that the grounds defense is claiming an appeal for are actually barred by the appeal waiver. It also tells us how Alex does not qualify for any claims that he didn't understand what he was signing. Alex was an attorney for almost three decades from a long line of attorneys, He was aware of the meaning of that waiver more than the average person who signs it. The rest of the document continues to repeat all of these same points and finally asks the court to dismiss his appeal altogether. They also filed a motion to suspend the briefing order, which we discussed briefing orders just a moment ago. It's the court schedule of when things are due. They asked for that to be suspended while they await the court's decision on this motion. The court granted that on August the 9th, and also on the 9th, notified defense that their response to this motion to dismiss is due on August 19th. So I will be looking for that and updating you on that when it is filed. We also have an order on the Austin Stanley versus Will Folks case. If you haven't seen that, I have two podcasts on this case that I'll link in comments as well and that will catch you up on that. But in the last update, we went over a motion to compel filed by Mark Tinsley on behalf of his client, Austin Stanley, because the defense was playing dense when responding to plaintiff's questions. Now, Will Folks and Fitz News had published Austin Stanley's picture, calling him a person of interest in the death of Stephen Smith. They did not use his name. It was a case of mistaken identity, but they used his picture. So as I've showed you before, the first thing filed is that summons and complaint, and then defense has to file an answer where they have to systematically go through each of the accusations and respond. Naturally, if they're claiming they're not guilty, they don't want to put answers down that directly say, I'm guilty. So when you in fact did do what you're accused of doing, you either have to lie or you have to skirt around the questions and not answer them directly, which is what happened. In the responses that defense served to plaintiff's requests, they were very, very vague. And so plaintiffs are saying, hey, we need a little help from the court. And that's what this motion to compel is. It's asking the court to order them to give proper responses. This order covers two of those situations. 
The question presented by plaintiffs was, please admit that Fitz News published a photograph of Austin Stanley with Stephen Smith and that the photograph included the text, Prime Suspects, as seen below. Now here you see this picture. This came directly from information published by Fitz News and Will Folks. We see Austin Stanley's picture there. He's the one to the right of Stephen Smith. We see the words Prime Suspects. The only answer to this is to admit, yes, I, I posted this. But their response was, defendants object to this request as vague and ambiguous on the grounds it does not define, identify, or otherwise clarify either the time, place, or manner of publication. Defendants further object to this request as vague and ambiguous on the grounds it does not define, identify, clarify, or otherwise refer to Fitz's new state of mind when making the subject publication the absence of which also prevents defendant from truthfully admitting or denying this request in its entirety. Defense admit that they published the photograph to the extent this request attempts to obtain admission that such publication was either intentional or purposeful, was done with malice, or was either actuated by ill will or with the design to causelessly and wantonly injure the plaintiff or with such recklessness as to show a conscious indifference toward plaintiff's rights, defendant specifically deny the claim. Now remember, and you'll see this in the previous updates, this didn't happen once. This lawsuit came after it had happened once. Austin Stanley's mother contacted Will Folks, told him it was a mistake. He responded in an email saying that he would correct it, and then several months later published the same picture yet again after he absolutely knew this was the wrong person that's when we got to this lawsuit. So the court finds that this response, including the objections, admission, qualifications, and denials, are improper and unfounded and made in bad faith, and that request number one inquires only as to existence of the publication, not whether such was published with malice, negligence, or any other degree of culpability. The court further finds Fitz News published the above reference photograph and therefore defendants are not permitted to object, qualify, or deny request number one in any manner whatsoever. Defendants therefore are ordered to serve a proper response without any objections, qualifications, or denials to request number one within 10 days of entry of this order. But on the second point, where plaintiffs asked the court to compel, please admit that Fitz News was put on notice that this photograph portrayed Austin Stanley in a false light as seen in the below email. And this is Will Folk's return email to Austin Stanley's mother. The defendant's response was, defendants object this request as vague and ambiguous on the grounds it relies on the undefined terms notice and false light, both of which are subject to more than one reasonable interpretation. Responding to this request, defendants admit that such email was sent by William R. Folks III. And the court finds that this response is in line with South Carolina law code, so it does deny this request. So it's half granted, half denied. And I will keep my eye on this case as well. There is also an update in the suit filed by Nautilus, which is the insurance company that Alex cheated in order to collect the millions for Gloria Satterfield's fall. This case is still very much ongoing, though quietly in the background, pretty much unnoticed, but I do need to do a little more research on that. As you know, I like to have the whole story when I bring you a news update, and I didn't want to hold this whole update up while I did that. So that will be coming soon. And finally, an update on an announcement I also made here previously, and I'm so excited about this one. Juror Amy, whom you may have seen in interviews after the trial, as well as after the hearing with Justice Toll, she had announced that she was writing a book. She is now in the final stages of writing that book. She first announced it during an interview after the Justice Toll hearing. She said so many people have so many questions for her, and she thought instead of repeating herself every time, she'd put it all down in a book. Now, if you have ever heard Amy speak, you know how professional and well-spoken she is. I love the way this woman carries herself, so I really, really look forward to hearing an educated description of what really happened instead of the stories and accusations that we've been told by the likes of Egg Lady 
Egg Lady's Tenant, Dick and Jim's interpretation of things they've heard, Clerks of Court, Rhonda McElveen, and Becky Hill. None of these, in my opinion, have been reliable testaments of what happened behind the doors. And because of all the accusations that have been made, I think a lot of us would love to hear an actual, educated, intelligent person relay the information that they can relay at this time. The back of the jacket says Amy Williams was the 12th juror on the double murder trial for Alex Murdoch and was one of a few jurors interviewed on NBC's Today Show and on Fox Nation, Fall of the House of Murdoch. Follow Amy Williams on the winding road of juror emotions that started with a why me mentality and ended with a guilty verdict after conflicting testimony between a key witness and Alex Murdoch. She recalls the one attorney that made a difference in the case and played back the step-by-step walk on the grounds of the crime scene at Moselle. Her up-close and personal insights of Alex Murdoch is chilling. She holds an ABA in business from Strayer University. She's an accountant at a low country municipality about an hour outside of her hometown of Yemisee, South Carolina. And if I didn't love her enough already, Amy is also the founder and president of Sanctuary House, a domestic violence shelter. And people want to question her verdict because of something Egg Lady, an Egg Lady's tenant, said. Egg Lady who couldn't keep her mouth shut about being on the jury and tenant who couldn't keep her story straight. And because of their nonsense, people want to doubt a woman like this. But she has been working with the lovely Miss Hirsch So exciting stuff to look forward to in November. And thank you all so very much for joining today. And if you haven't already, please check out my series on the background of the Murdoch family called Murdoch Mafia, where I am deep diving the history of the family. And if you look at my channel with the playlist view, I have things in categories for you because I have several different series here and this helps keep it a little bit better organized so you can find all the episodes of each series easier. So you might want to take a look at that view. Until next time, this is Cassidy O'Connell saying stay well and stay tuned.